discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Another View. I'm Lisa Godley, co-producer of the show, filling in just one more week for our host, Barbara Ham Lee, who is really enjoying her time with her brand new granddaughter. Now, just as Barbara is doing everything in her power to make sure little patience gets off to a good start, we as parents need to do much better when it comes to our children, particularly when it comes to what they eat and how much exercise they get. According to the data, and this was taken almost 10 years ago, 25% of white children are overweight, and in the minority community, the number grows to 33%. And more recent data shows that our children will be the first ones not to outlive their parents if things continue as they are. But we don't want to go out like that. Joining us today, community organizer Seneca Bach of the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy, Reverend Dr. Dwight Nixon from St. Mary's Church of God in Christ, Dr. Sean Bryant, and Family Nutrition Program Coordinator Berlene Brown. Now, they're all here to discuss the effects of childhood obesity and what we can do to try and nip this problem in the bud. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bryant, I, I saw some of those numbers and the thing about not outliving the next generation is just frightening. Yeah, it, it truly is. And um, it's sad, but it seems the statistics are actually, the science is moving slower than what we're actually seeing um, in terms of our populations. But there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, prenatal care we're now learning has uh, something to do with the risk involved with our children becoming obese later in life. How well mothers are able to keep their sugar levels under control Role, which again drives home how important it is that pregnant women are getting prenatal care and that they're eating nutritious meals and monitoring their weight during pregnancy. Uh, the fact that our young people are leading somewhat sedentary lives, a lot of this is because of the multitude of technological devices that we have, um, everything from the computer to the handheld games uh, that really encourage young people to remain seated and not outside and not enjoying the outdoors and not being active. And when we put that together with poor eating habits uh, and lack of exercise, more than 10 hours of TV um, in a week, it, it's spelling you know, an increased risk of obesity uh, and being overweight for our young people. Now I'm imagining with that comes some other health issues with oh, being most overweight. definitely most definitely and it, it pretty much it crosses the the spectrum you know, the obvious is going to be diabetes and heart disease which you know of course um, leads to premature death but there are also are respiratory problems uh, gastrointestinal problems orthopedic problems psychiatric problems neurological disease I mean literally all of the systems uh, can be impacted when um, our young people as well as our adults are, are overweight. Okay. Now, Seneca, tell me about this initiative. What are we doing? What's in the works? <laughs> yes, thank you, Lisa, for having us. We're working in partnership, meaning we, the Center for Regional Citizenship, which is a WHRO subsystem, along with the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy, which has been around for 27 years, and basically they develop uh, public policy that impact low, marginalized, uh, low-income communities across this state. And what we are doing, we are part of the movement, because it's become a movement now in terms of childhood obesity, and we're working directly with the faith-based community because we recognize that they have a unique ability to tap into the families, the, the, the influencers of the uh, community, particularly those parents who can do something about the way that they modify behavior to impact childhood obesity. And so what we're doing is working throughout Western Tidewater mm -hmm. to bring that community together to galvanize them around this issue. And then in year two, we're in year one now, in year two, we literally will be working on public policy prescriptions that impact the structural environment of our community that kind of leads to this problem in the first place. So we're bringing everyone together. Okay. And so that's why we're here. All righty, Dr. Nixon, what's going on at your place of worship? Well, what we're trying to do, Lisa, is to, <clears throat> first of all, trying to bring the awareness to uh, our congregants and to inform them of the importance and the, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the, um, 
trying to just get them to understand the, uh, this is an epidemic that needs to be confronted. And the community of faith have always been on the fronts of, of challenging these various issues, especially when it comes to childhood obesity. Uh, we have so many people that are suffering from uh, this disease, and uh, I think it's the church responsibility is to come and to bring these issues in, up to the forefront letting the people know that uh, this is a problem that can be solved. But first, we have to become aware in how to deal with these problems. Um, one of the pr approaches we are trying to do is to try to get the other churches involved, uh, create community groups, um, show the, um, the detrimentalness of, of this disease, and to let the people know that uh, this problem can be solved, and the church can play a vital part, vital role, in helping and try to solve these problems, which is uh, uh, come through childhood obesity. Okay, already, Berlin. Where do we go? Um, um, when we were talking about what do we do when children have already been addicted to McDonald's and, and other types of fast food? How do we introduce healthy eating to them at this point? Well, Lisa, that's a good question. In our program, we work with low-income parents, and we help them to learn how to make better decisions. We also have a program that targets young people, and what we know from the research is that most of the calories, that the empty calories that young people consume come from drinks, um, soft drinks, and the snack foods that um, they usually uh, eat. We know that kids are not going to stop snacking, but what we try to do in our program is to introduce them to new foods. And what we have found is that if we get the children involved in gardening types of things or preparation of the foods and selecting the foods and then preparing the foods, they're more likely to taste those foods. They're more likely to uh, begin to try new foods. So that's kind of where we start. We start first where uh, they're, they have the most empty calories and that's soft drinks. And some, sometimes we find when we talk to children that they never ever drink water. They drink soft drinks first, Gatorade second, and all sorts of things. And what we know is that those things are laden with sugar. They're, they're just really full of sugar. So we try to get children to consume more water and we introduce different types of fruit <coughs> drinks to them. Now the fruit drinks have sugar too, but what we have introduced children to is to use a carbonated water to kind of make like a cocktail with the fruit juices so that they're not consuming so much sugar. But the difference is the fruit juice has some nutrients, the sodas don't. Okay, I recently visited a school um, in Portsmouth and I was speaking to the principal and she was telling me they have completely gotten rid of their soda machines. Good. And they have juices and Good. water bottles, Good. you know, in the machines in an effort to try and <laughs> get the kids <laughs> to do, quote unquote, the right thing right. When, it, when it comes to, right. to food and nutrition. And you've been working with even younger children, yes. trying to teach them about nutrition and even growing vegetables. <laughs> exactly. Um, with the STOP organization, I am the supervisor of the community garden activities and we've had the opportunity to actually develop gardens throughout Tidewater and get young people involved with growing these vegetables, learning about the benefits nutritiously for them. Uh, they're exercising while they're out there, helping us to, to you know dig up and make rows and plant the seeds and water and they're learning about the the whole process of growing and also getting on a better uh, a better appreciation for these fruits and vegetables uh, and incorporating them in their diets on a regular basis. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dr. Daniel Baltimore, the pastor of Mount Nebo Church in Surrey County, um, they have been doing quite a few initiatives at that church trying to get some things going and get people to be healthy. And um, Dr. Baltimore was telling me in an earlier interview that they are um, very excited about some of the things that they're doing. And he says, we, we've all got to do better when it comes mm -hmm. to what we eat. What we're eating in 2009 is not the same thing we were eating in 1954. It has all the same names, looks the same, but it's not the same. But what I mean is that, that obesity began with refining process of foods and sugars 
As that kicked in, so did obesity. The sugar intake kicked in, so did obesity. They paralleled each other. And so what happened is, in the classical food pyramid, where you see so many servings of bread, so many servings of vegetables, they're not the same thing. It's almost an irrelevant chart because the bread in the 50s was whole wheat. The bread now is refined flour. The vegetables are canned and bathed in um, syrups. Now, Mount Nebo recently held a big, Biggest Loser contest. Um, that was just last month, and they also held a competition to see who could walk the most steps. Now, you had to walk at least 10,000 steps a day, but folks are getting in there and getting that exercise done. Now, Seneca, what are some of the other things that um, churches, faith-based <coughs> organizations are being encouraged to do? Wow, uh, there's a lot going on in our community, and I am, I have to applaud Dr. Baltimore for his leadership, I do know him. Um, we have some churches that were involved in community gardens. We have churches who are involved in prevention programs, working with programs such as Let's Get Real. We have churches who want to be a part of the public policy development piece. Uh, we have churches that are coming in in different um, ways. And that's one of the things that this program is doing in terms of WHRO. We have a unique opportunity to create a platform and pathways for churches to buy in because different churches have different passions. So we don't want to leave anyone out. So if a church has a particular passion point, say for an example, they want to have an exercise and eating program, then we will help facilitate that. If we have someone who wants to build a coalition, then we'll help facilitate that. The fact of the matter is, is that we definitely must absolutely engage the faith leadership community, particularly African American leadership, um, in this process because they have the ability to affect the change better than anyone else. And so we are doing that with this um, project. Secondarily, in terms of Robert Wood Johnson, I just wanted to go back a little bit. Um, this is a program that we're working through Robert Wood Johnson, which Robert Wood Johnson has been working on this about 10 years. And they have a goal of changing the trajectory on a national level of childhood obesity by 2015. So WHRO, along with the Virginia Interfaith Center, we are really blessed to be a part of this, but it's not just us. We can't do this unless we have folks like Pastor Nixon, the doctor, and Berlin assisting us to do this in this community, particularly in Western Tidewater, where the numbers actually are uh, slightly higher than the state average as well as the national average. It pops up as a hot spot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Now, Berlin, recently um, the First Lady was, was captured um, out at a farmer's market getting uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. How important is it? Does, it? does it matter that you're getting fresh from the farmer's market? Tell me a little bit about the, the fruits and vegetables, this canned opposed to um, fresh. Lisa, what we, um, what we know is that fresh is best. And um, the populations that we work with, we're working with limited resource families. And uh, what we try to say to them, if you can buy fresh, buy fresh. If you can't, then try frozen. And, and if you have to buy can, we ask them to uh, at least remove the liquid that the, the vegetable, the fruit has been stored in so that they can uh, get the best nutrient value from the food. But we know that the fresh is better. And I think what Dr. Brian is doing is helping people to grow their own would help because when you go in the grocery store, produce is very, very expensive. And so what our clients say to us who are food stamp household families or they're eligible, they're saying that the produce is too expensive. If I use my money for the produce, then I won't have money for other things. So what we try to say to them is if you can at least do a fresh fruit or vegetable at least once a week, then that beats not doing it at all. But we know the best nutrient value comes from the fresh produce. Okay, all righty. And what do we, what do you recommend as far as um, the younger kids, the adolescents, the teenagers, as far as snacks for them? Because they're used to grabbing a candy bar. Right. Um, what we do, um, Lisa, they're used to grabbing a candy bar. They're used to grabbing the Doritos and the Fritos and all those kinds of things that are laden with salt and uh, fat. What we do is we have a very nutritious uh, trail mix that we make for children that we have them to make. And we use uh, good things like whole wheat cereal or Cheerios, which is whole wheat. And we add peanuts and other 
cran raisins, raisins, all those kinds of things that have some nutrient value, yet it tastes sweet to them. And if we have peanuts, it has a little salt for them. And so it satisfies those tastes that they're accustomed to, but yet they're getting some nutritional value from those things. Okay. All right, Dr. Bryant, now everybody doesn't have a big backyard and a lot of, a lot of room, but what do we do when we want to start out and just try to grow something? Well, what do you recommend? surprisingly, there are a lot of vegetables that can be grown um, in containers. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes are a wonderful um, example for that. Uh, using the side strip border of your house um, can be used. Or, as I indicated, we've got the gardens throughout Tidewater, and we're really encouraging individuals in the community to become involved um, with this activity. And, of course, all of the harvesting is for the community as well as We've made donations, um, we've granted a 10% donation of all of the produce from the community gardens to the food bank. Um, and this was done because we recognize how important the fresh fruits and vegetables are and we want to make them more accessible. So it's, you know, it's an opportunity for families to get together, for, you know, different generations to get together at, on the, at the community garden. So we really want to encourage people to come on out and get involved, you know, and get some of the produce that we, we have to offer and learn and share. And I, I think this can be positive for, for everyone that's involved at many different levels. Okay. All righty. Dr. Nixon, what kind of a response when you um, started talking about this to, to the members um, of your church, what kind of a response are you getting back from them? Well, it's, it's a positive response. Um, a lot of people understand that we have to, to uh, change our eating habits. Um, fast foods, they're not good for us. Um, I think we have to understand it's very important that we eat close to the ground. Uh, that's where most of our nutrition comes from. Uh, those foods that comes from the ground, you, you know, can't find any cholesterol in those, those foods there. And so, uh, as I stated, when, we, when you bring the awareness to the people, uh, they understand the importance of uh, trying to create uh, good eating habits. We live in a different time now. Years ago, uh, the children could go outside and play, uh, have skates, and now we're more homebound, and, uh, which create, uh, creates a lot of problems for us health-wise. And so um, I think they are, they, are, they are encouraged when you talk with them and let them know that uh, it's important to you know, try to have better eating habits and eating the right foods. So I'm going to come back to you a little bit, um, kind of piggybacking off of what Dr. Nixon was talking about. We went out looking for children playing, um, kind of had a hard time finding some outside. So, so what are we doing? What do we do to get them to get outside and do that quote unquote free play? I'm glad you asked that question. That's a question that doesn't get asked very often. It's an important question um, because it's not just about the food source, Lisa. It's also about the environmental issues or the environmental barriers. For an example, in a lot of our rural communities, the way that they're constructed, they don't have proper uh, uh, bike paths or walking paths. They may have to cross a large, busy street to get from one place to another, and sometimes that's a barrier. The other uh, barrier that we find oftentimes is also there's an issue that we need to deal with in terms of violence in the community. A number of our families, particularly low wealth families, are literally uh, keeping their children indoors for fear of allowing them out to play. So there's opportunities, a number of different opportunities for us to impact the environment that um, lead to some of the reasons why our children or our families can't get access to good food, uh, good food sources. And that's one of the things that we're trying to work on. Um, so those are three areas that I can think of that we don't talk about that kind of speak to your question. Another thing that I think is uh, really important is going back to what Dr. Bryant said, opening up opportunities for us to come together. Uh, you know, we tend to be a communal people and uh, kind of knocking down some of those barriers and opening up those opportunities for us to grow the, the, the vegetables and grow the fruit together and make that a fellowship. And that's where I see a role for the churches to play, mm -hmm. to be a, uh, a convener and a facilitator for something like that on a regular basis. So again, the, the role of the, the, the black church and the church in general is pivotal 
pivotal to bringing us all together around this issue. And then I'll just finish up by saying this again, that WHRO and the work that it's doing, um, and I do want to just put a plug in for one of my colleagues, um, Ann uh, Fitzgibbon, who started this work about three years ago through um, the Healthy Habits um, program, um, looking at ways to create an environment where we can all plug in to this issue because it's going to take the entire community, multifactorial, multi-categorical, to, to really deal with this because this, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So, you know, pick an issue, pick a pathway, and get in, and get in. Thank you so much for that, <laughs> Seneca. I, I really appreciate it. And You're with welcome. that, unfortunately, we are out of time because this is one of those topics that I know is near and dear to my heart. And yes. I thank you all for, for coming out today and, and talking about it and, and bringing some attention to it. Very special thanks to Seneca Bach, to Reverend Dwight Nixon, to Dr. Sean Bryant, and to Berlin Brown. When we come back, we'll take a look at one program that's working to keep children healthy and strong. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. Over the years, we've seen quite a few things change in an effort to improve our children's health. Many schools, as I mentioned earlier, have taken out that soda machine and those vending machines and replaced them with juice and water and healthy snacks. Some fast food restaurants even offer children fresh and healthy alternatives to french fries and tater tots. But what are we doing to encourage our children to make better choices and get out there and exercise? Well, in Suffolk, there's a program that's doing all it can to help children win in the fight against childhood obesity. They call it free play, a time when a child can just have fun doing whatever they enjoy most, and the activity can be as intense or laid back as they so choose. At the East End Baptist Church Child Development Center in Suffolk, one activity in particular is the clear favorite. Let the corner play go up and play on the swing. Let the swing. Get on the swing. But organized activities can be just as much fun. All right, we're going to have a soccer ball race. Try keeping a ball in the center of a colorful parachute and see how many muscles you use. Or run a relay while kicking a soccer ball. You'll definitely burn more calories than you would playing Nintendo on the couch. Look, now go the other way. Go back the other way. Go, go, go. At a time when so many school districts have cut out recess altogether, citing that it interferes with the child's academics, at the East End Baptist Church Child Development Center, they understand the importance of recess in a child's development and make sure their children get an hour a day. Come on, Faye, Faye, come on. Reverend come on, Burnett Faye. Boone directs the program. Oh, you got it, now you got to go back the other way. Childhood obesity has been a concern of mine for quite a while. I taught in public schools for 30 years, and the longer I taught, the more I saw children who were um, overweight and not used to exercise. And even now, in early childhood here at the center, I still see children who come in who are not used to doing a lot of movement and exercise. They're used to computer games. They're used to little things and just staying inside. Um, and that's not good for their cognitive development as well as their physical development. Uh, they need the movement. They need to jump. They need to run. Reverend Boone also realizes that the fight against childhood obesity doesn't stop with making sure her children get enough exercise. What they eat is also a key component. And far too often these days, our children are eating the wrong things. They recognize all of the fast food places when they see them and they're used to that. A lot of the really nutritional meals that we serve, some, some of the things is the first time that they have had this particular thing, like zucchini or broccoli. But however, we try to introduce this to them and give them the ability to taste it, and then maybe they'll like it, and quite often they do. What kind of sandwich is that? Peanut butter. 
Peanut butter, what else is in there? Jelly. And jelly. Okay, is it good? Okay. Trey, what did they serve you today for lunch? Soup, milk, grapes, peanut butter, jelly. What tastes yeah, is the now. best to you? Look at my mustard. The grapes. Why do you like grapes? Mama, good. Good food. Good food. You now, now, who can tell me if you eat a good lunch, what does that do for you? Make, Make you strong. Strong and healthy children. Just what we're aiming for. Absolutely. Now, if you like the show, please sign up for our eView newsletter, a once a week reminder of what's coming up on future shows. Just log on to anotherview.tv or write us at 5200 Hampton Boulevard. Now, if I can pry Barbara away from that new granddaughter, she will be back next week and we will see you then. Good night.